must Pepper and the Short have had more hair than Charles the Bald? Was Charlemagne's reign in Spain mainly in the plain? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I'm Professor Jerome Markenberg and the host of History Waits for No One. In this episode, we'll see the rise of Islam and the collapse of both the Persian and Eastern Roman empires. The rise of the Carolingians, starting with Charles Martel and continuing with Pepin the Short and Charlemagne. How Charlemagne put together the greatest empire seen in the West since the collapse of the Roman Empire and sparked the Carolingian Renaissance of culture and learning. How the actions of the Byzantine Emperor Leo III in the iconoclastic controversy led to a split between Eastern and Western Christianity and the first waves of Viking and Magyar attacks led to the destruction of the Carolingian hegemony. But first, make sure to click like, share, and subscribe on that little bell thingy so we can continue to bring you more great history episodes just like this one. The story of Islam begins with Muhammad, who was born in 570 in Mecca of a poor branch of the Quraysh tribe, which controlled Mecca and its pilgrimage trade. It's one of the, pretty much almost the only reason why anybody went to Mecca, though it was right on the caravan route between the Eastern Mediterranean and the main ports of the South in what is now Yemen. Orphaned at an early age, Muhammad was brought up by his uncle, Abu Talib, and on reaching manhood, worked alternately as a merchant and shepherd until, at age 25, he married a wealthy 40-year-old widow, Khadija, and began driving her caravans north to Damascus and Gaza. One day, in his early 40s, he's middle-aged, his wife is considerably older, dissatisfied with his life. He commenced to wandering at night in the desert, often retreating to a cave, the cave of Hira, senior, in the Jabal al-Nur mountains around Mecca, meditating and reflecting until one night, the night of destiny and the month of Ramadan, the Archangel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad, he said, summoning him to prophesy God's message to the Arabs and the world. And after three years of prayer and meditation, during which only his wife, Khadija, his cousin, Ali ibn Talib, and his close friend, Abu Bakr, believed him, Muhammad began to do just that. Muhammad claimed that he was divinely appointed as the last in a line of prophets from Abraham to Jesus and began preaching a message of one strict monotheism, no trinity as in Christianity, a strict monotheism more like Judaism. Second, heaven for the good and hell for the wicked, nothing in between, no limbo, no purgatory. Three, that someday there will be an end to this world, a last judgment and bodily resurrection of the dead in which you will get your actual body back, but it will be a perfect body. And finally, salvation through belief and behavior through good works. But his kin of the Quraysh 
did not accept Muhammad's claim as God's prophet. Feeling threatened by his advocacy of breaking and destroying all the idols, including the idols in the Kaaba, the main reason that there was a pilgrimage center at Mecca. In 622, what is now known as the Hijra, marking the start of the Islamic calendar, Muhammad and his followers were forced to flee Mecca for Medina, an oasis about 200 miles to the north, which needed an impartial judge for disputes among its pagan, Jewish, and Christian tribes. These years shaped the nature of early Islam, with beliefs emerging on the necessity of fighting for both God and truth. For Muhammad took over Medina, and after driving out all Christians and Jews who refused to recognize him as God's prophet and forcing the pagans to convert on pain of death, he began to war on his neighbors and was soon drawn into a fight with his kin, the Quraysh, for control of these trade routes. Eventually, after several battles, the Battle of Badr, Uhud, the Trench, and Kabar, Muhammad took Mecca in the year 630. The Quraysh were forcibly converted, and the Kaaba cleansed of its idols and images. After the conquest of Mecca, Muhammad sent his forces north and south along the trade routes of the Hejaz, where they defeated local tribes and forced conversion, destroying their temples, shrines, and idols, as depicted here. Muhammad died, however, shortly thereafter, in the year 632, and joining the conversion of the infidels, who were given the choice of conversion or death. However, people of the book, Christians and Jews primarily, were not to be harmed as long as they submitted to Muslim rule. Those that refused, the men could be killed with impunity, and their lands and women taken as spoil. Within a century, Islamic armies swept out of Arabia, conquering the entire Middle East and North Africa, most of Iberia, and were at the gates of India. However, they failed to take Constantinople and Byzantine Anatolia, this part right here, while their advance was finally stopped across the Caucasus by the Jewish Khazars in the year 720, and across the Pamirs in 751 when they encountered the numerous Chinese armies. Similarly, when they came across the Indus and ran into very, very numerous Hindus. Meanwhile, in Frankland, Clovis's successors, the Merovingian kings, were ineffectual and weak, engaging in brutal civil wars, leading to the division of the kingdom, until one family, the Arnolfines, descended from St. Arnulf of Metz, took control as mayors of the palace not unlike the Japanese shogun. They ruled, but did not reign. In 732, a major Arab invasion into Gaul was decisively defeated by the Arnulfine mayor of the palace, Charles the Hammer Martel. Yes, Chuck the Hammer, Martel meaning the hammer, it's hammer time. At the Battle of Tours, earning him such prestige that his family was thenceforth known from his first name, the Latin version of his name, Carolus, as the Carolingians. At the same time, back in Byzantium, the Emperor Leo III, who reigned from 717 to 741, who had saved the Byzantine Empire from complete collapse and began driving the Arabs out of Anatolia, 
then for some reason not quite understood to this day, initiated what has come to be called iconoclasm. Perhaps feeling that this was why the former Byzantine subjects in Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and North Africa had returned or turned to Islam. In fact, it was because Islam offered these subject peoples a much lower taxation rate, an end to imperial oversight and heavy economic regulation. And since most of those Christians in Syria, Palestine, and Egypt were considered heretic Christians by their own government and heavily persecuted, the Arabs didn't care. As long as you didn't, as long as you submitted, they didn't care what kind of Christian you were. Instead, though, Leo thought it was this idea of graven images, which, of course, in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no graven image. So he ordered the destruction of paintings and painting over of all religious statues and paintings. This caused the popes to reject it, lest the still quasi or pseudo-Christian barbarians in the West would suddenly revert to paganism. They were not fully Christianized. They were Christian in name, some of them in name only. Many of their former pagan customs had been co-opted and became Christian customs, so Christian quote-unquote customs, so that if we suddenly had removed all the paintings and destroyed the statues, they would quickly return back to paganism. So this begins a split between mainstream Christianity and the Mediterranean, one which would lead to Roman Catholicism in the West and Eastern Orthodoxy in the East. In the West, iconoclasm enabled Chuck the Hammer's son, Pepin the Short, clearly shorter than Pepin the Elder or Pepin the Younger. Anyway, Pepin the Short, 741 to 768, to cut a deal with the Pope, whereby the last Merovingian king was deposed and Pepin made king in his place, in return for Pepin defeating the Lombards and protecting Rome from the Byzantines. Meanwhile, back in Islam, and the Islamic Caliphate, an uprising of Persian Muslims allowed their leader, Abu Abbas, or Shedder of Blood, what a great name, to defeat the last Umayyad Caliph in the year 750, and then held a special dinner of reconciliation, which sounded very good until assassins came out behind the curtains and killed every single one of the Umayyads, except one of them, Abd ar-Rahman, managed to escape all the way to Spain, where he set up his own caliphate in Cordoba. Abul Abbas then moved the capital closer from Damascus to a little village named Baghdad on a site in the Tigris. Set up as a round fortress city, thus strengthening Persian influence. But from the start, the empire was in decline as one region after another became de facto independent. While this was happening in the Middle East, in Frankland, Pepin the Short's son, Carolus Magnus or Charlemagne, what I tend to call Chuck the Great, who reigned from 768 to 814, went on to build the greatest state seen in the West since the collapse of the Roman Empire. Chuck the Great began by conquering the pagan Saxons of northern Germany, reforcing them to convert to Christianity, largely in a series of long, difficult campaigns, finally ending with genocidal slaughter. Something about Germans and genocide. Not sure what that's about. 
Chuck went on to destroy the Avars, who had set up shop in what is now Hungary, succeeding the Huns, who had set up shop there. The Avars were then destroyed because they had raided on Germany and Italy. There was a scourge. Though Charlemagne does not conquer and make this a province of his empire. He also subjected the various Slavic tribes beyond the Elbe River to tributary status, such as the Czechs, Moravians, Sorbs, Veleti, Obadrites, Croats, and Serbs. They paid tribute, but this was not set up as a province. Responding to pleas from the Christians in Spain, he crossed the Pyrenees, defeated the Arabs, and established the Spanish March. A little bit less one right here, a little bit towards the area here, which evolved into the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. And sadly, his reign was not actually in the plain. Building on the deeds of his father, Pepin the Short, Charlemagne then attacked and destroyed the Lombard kingdom in Italy and annexed all the lands north of Rome, but was careful not to attack into the south and especially not to deal with the Byzantine lands in the south, not to wanting war with what was then a resurgent Byzantine empire. Then in Rome, at Christmas Mass in the year 800, against his wishes, Pope Leo III crowned Chuck Emperor of the Romans, a title with no real power, which only served to tick off the Byzantines, who claimed to be the only legitimate Roman emperors. Now, throughout his reign, Charlemagne encouraged learning setting up a school in his palace, himself taking lessons and trying to learn Latin. Not very successfully, by the way, but he did try, ordering that his children all be educated. And he also ordered that all abbeys and churches have at least one copy of the Bible and one copy of each of the patristic commentaries, those primarily by St. Gregory the Great, St. Jerome, St. Anselm, and St. Augustine. This, of course, required the training of many scribes. Charlemagne's encouragement of the training of educated clergy not only raised the intellectual level of the church, which had been sinking into illiteracy and barbarism, and illiteracy is notably bad for a religion based on a book, but did enable much of the Greco-Roman heritage, the books that had survived in the West, to be preserved. Charlemagne also presided over church synods ordering and insisting on needed church and monastic reform within his realm, and ordering about the clergy, even the popes, like an old-fashioned god-king. Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, or Lou the Pious, as I call him, who reigned from 814 to 840, continued his father's policies. But notice, his name is not Louis the Killer, or Louis, shedder of blood, but Louis the pious. Clearly more of an administrator than a warrior. He managed to hold the empire together, but this proved difficult as new attacks by Magyars, Arabs, and Vikings began. Unlike his father, Louis the pious was survived by three sons who, by Frankish custom, divided the empire between them in 843 in the Treaty of Verdun. Yes, for the Frankish peoples, whether you were royalty or commoners, the poorest of the poor, each of your surviving sons got an equal share. 
which was largely in part the reason behind all the civil wars of the Merovingians. Pepin the Short, Charlemagne, and Louis the Pious were in some ways lucky, or was a divine providence, that they were the only sons to survive. But unfortunately for Lou, he had three sons, each at each other's throat. So, Charles the Bald, who clearly had more hair than his father, received West Frankland. This will slowly evolve into what we call France. Lou the German, born in Germany, spent most of his childhood in Germany, received East Frankland, which evolved into Germany. And then Lothar, the oldest son, received the Frankish homeland along the Rhine. From the Alps to the North Sea, along with Burgundy and Italy and the title of emperor, emperor. This, of course, seems to be perhaps the worst of the bit, though this was the Frankish homeland, the heart and soul of the empire. Sadly for Lothar and successors, pushing west from West Frankland and east from East Frankland. Eventually, this land will be divided between them, but co costing well over a thousand years of warfare between who controls it, France or Germany. In 987, the last of the Carolingians in the West, Louis V, died childless, and Hugh Capet, Count of Paris, was elected to succeed him. Hugh Capet's descendants continued to rule France until the year 1848. Though his power was largely nominal, confined to the lands which he himself controlled around Paris. But at this point, the Carolingian hegemony collapsed due to attacks by more barbarians. This time, Vikings from the north, and Magyars from the east, and some Arab attacks from the south. And as the forces of the central power could not defend everywhere simultaneously, or the main army arrive in time to fend off quickly moving raiders, so power devolved into the hands of local lords on the spot, who were able to respond as quickly to these raiders as the letters themselves were to arrive, ravage, plunder, and withdraw, thus giving rise to a system known today as feudalism. Let me know what you liked about this episode of History Waits for No One. Be sure to click like, share, subscribe, and that little bell thingy, as it will help bring you more great episodes. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.